Welcome to this presentation on Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a condition that affects the brain and causes problems with movement. It can cause symptoms like shaking when at rest, stiffness in the muscles, slow movements, and trouble with balance. The pathophysiology involves the progressive degeneration and death of dopaminergic neurons. These are a specific type of nerve cell that produces a neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical messenger in the brain that plays a critical role in regulating movement, mood, and other functions. The exact cause is not fully understood, but there are several mechanisms that have been proposed. One theory suggests abnormal folding and aggregation of proteins in dopaminergic neurons may play a role in their death. A protein called alpha-synuclein accumulates and forms abnormal clumps called Lewy bodies. These disrupt normal cellular processes and can lead to the death of do dopaminergic neurons. Oxidative stress refers to an imbalance between the production of harmful reactive oxygen species, ROS, and the ability of cells to neutralize them. Dopaminergic neurons are particularly susceptible to oxidative stress. Mitochondria are the energy producing organelles within cells, so dysfunction of mitochondria, such as impaired energy production, and increased production of ROS has been implicated in Parkinson's. Mitochondrial dysfunction can trigger a cascade of events, including oxidative stress, protein misfolding, and inflammation, and these all ultimately lead to death of dopaminergic neurons. Inflammation is the body's immune response to injury or damage. Chronic neuroinflammation can lead to the release of inflammatory molecules, activation of immune cells, and damage to dopaminergic neurons. It can be triggered by various factors, including alpha-synuclein accumulation, oxidative stress, and other factors, and can contribute to dopaminergic neuron death. While most cases of Parkinson's do not have a clear genetic cause, there are some genetic mutations that have been linked to familial forms of the disease. The death of dopaminergic neurons leads to a progressive loss of dopamine in specific regions of the brain, such as the substantia nigra, and this disrupts the normal functioning of neural circuits involved in movement and other functions, leading to the characteristic symptoms. Dopamine helps to facilitate smooth, coordinated movements by transmitting signals from the substantia nigra to another region of the brain called the striatum. The loss of dopaminergic neurons leads to a reduction in dopamine in the striatum, and this results in imbalanced neurons activity and motor dysfunction. In addition to motor symptoms, low dopamine levels can also contribute to non-motor symptoms, including changes in mood, cognition, and behavior. It's important to note that while low dopamine levels are a hallmark feature, there are other neurotransmitters and brain regions that are also affected, and these contribute to the complex array of symptoms that individuals may experience. There's also disruption of the basal ganglia, a group of interconnected nuclei located deep within the brain, and these are involved in the regulation of movement. The basal ganglia are responsible for fine-tuning and coordinating movements by facilitating or inhibiting signals from the motor cortex, a region of the brain involved in planning and initiating voluntary movement. The reduction in dopamine levels disrupts the balance of inhibitory and excitatory signals within the basal ganglia. This leads to an overactivity of the inhibitory output from the basal ganglia to the thalamus, a relay station for motor signals to the motor cortex. The basal ganglia also have connections with other regions of the brain that are involved in mood, cognition, and behavior. So patients may have deficits in attention, concentration, memory, and executive function. There are likely other factors involved in the pathophysiology of the disease as well. However, understanding these underlying changes in neural circuitry is crucial for developing effective treatments for the disease. Let's look at genetic and environmental factors involved in Parkinson's disease. Some of the key genetic factors include gene mutations. Mutations in certain genes have been identified to be associated with Parkinson's disease. Mutations in these genes disrupt the normal functioning of proteins involved in various cellular processes, leading to an increased risk of the disease. If a close family member, such as a parent or sibling, has been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, the risk of developing the condition is higher compared to individuals without a family history of the disease. However, it is important to note that not all cases of Parkinson's disease with a family history are caused by genetic factors because other environmental or non-genetic factors may also play a role. 
Certain genetic variants or variations in specific genes have also been associated with an increased risk and may be more common in certain populations or ethnic groups. Parkinson's disease is likely influenced by multiple genetic factors, and complex interactions between multiple genes and other environmental factors may contribute to an individual's risk of developing the condition. It's important to note, having a genetic risk factor or a family history of Parkinson's disease does not necessarily mean that any given individual will develop the condition. And not all cases of Parkinson's disease have a clear genetic cause. Now let's look at environmental factors. Exposure to certain environmental toxins, such as pesticides, herbicides, industrial chemicals, heavy metals, other environmental pollutants can increase the risk. Exposure to these toxins may occur through various routes, such as inhalation, ingestion, or skin contact. Some studies have suggested that living in rural areas or consuming well water may increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. Well water may be contaminated with pesticides, nitrates, and other chemicals. Certain occupations, such as farming, welding, and manufacturing, may involve exposure to environmental toxins or chemicals. Occupational exposure to pesticides, solvents, and other chemicals has been associated with an increased risk of developing the condition. Exposure to air pollution, particularly fine particulate matter and other airborne pollutants, has been suggested to be associated with an increased risk. Air pollution may result from industrial emissions, vehicle exhaust, or other sources, and long-term exposure to such pollutants may contribute to the development of the disease. Some lifestyle factors, such as diet, exercise, and sleep patterns, may also impact the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. A diet rich in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory nutrients may have a protective effect against Parkinson's disease, while a sedentary lifestyle, poor sleep, and unhealthy diet choices may increase the risk of developing the condition. It's important to note that the relationship between environmental factors and Parkinson's disease is complex and not fully understood. The diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is primarily based on clinical evaluation and assessment of a patient's medical history, symptoms, and physical examination. There is no specific test or biomarker that can definitively confirm Parkinson's disease. So the diagnosis is typically made based on a combination of clinical findings and ruling out other possible causes of similar symptoms. Typical diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease include the presence of motor symptoms, Parkinson's disease is characterized by specific motor symptoms, including bradykinesia, a slowness of movement, rigidity, stiffness of the muscles, and tremors, involuntary shaking. The presence of two or more of these motor symptoms, along with a good response to levodopa, is often considered a strong indicator of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease often begins on one side of the body, and may later involve the other side as the disease progresses. This asymmetrical pattern of motor symptoms can be a diagnostic clue. The absence of atypical features, such as early and prominent balance problems, early and severe cognitive impairment, or other atypical symptoms can help differentiate Parkinson's disease from other neurodegenerative disorders. Parkinson's disease is a progressive disorder, and the presence of a gradual worsening of motor symptoms over time can be suggestive of the disease. Additional diagnostic tests may be performed to support the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and to rule out other possible causes. These tests can include magnetic resonating imaging, which can help visualize the brain structures in great detail, including the substantia nigra, that region of the brain that's affected in Parkinson's disease. However, the imaging findings in Parkinson's disease on MRI are usually nonspecific. That means they may not show any specific abnormalities. In some cases, MRI may be used to rule out other conditions that may mimic Parkinson's disease, such as brain tumors, strokes, or other structural abnormalities. Computed tomography scans, CT scans, can provide detailed images of the brain's structures and can help identify any structural abnormalities, such as tumors, hemorrhages, or other lesions that might be causing the symptoms. CT scans are particularly useful in ruling out other possible causes of similar symptoms in emergency situations where a rapid assessment is needed. Remember, there are no specific images findings that can confirm or definitively diagnose Parkinson's disease.
A dopamine transporter, or DAT, is a type of nuclear medicine imaging that can help assess the dopamine transporter levels in the brain. DAT scans are not typically used for routine diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, but they may be helpful in certain cases where the diagnosis is uncertain. The DAT scan is a relatively new imaging modality, and it can help differentiate between Parkinson's disease and other conditions that might mimic its symptoms, such as essential tremor, drug-induced Parkinsonism, and other forms of Parkinsonism. But remember, it is not a definitive test for Parkinson's disease. Blood tests are not commonly used as primary diagnostic tools for Parkinson's disease, as there are no specific blood markers that can definitively confirm the presence of the condition. However, blood tests may be ordered as part of the diagnostic workup to rule out other potential causes of Parkinsonian symptoms or to assess certain factors that might be relevant to managing the condition. A complete blood count, or CBC, is not used to directly diagnose with Parkinson's, but it may be ordered to rule out other potential causes of similar symptoms, such as anemia or infection. A comprehensive metabolic panel, or CMP, is used to assess the overall health and function of the body, which may be relevant in management of the disease. Certain medications used to manage Parkinson's disease, for example, might require monitoring of liver or kidney function. Blood glucose levels might be important in patients with diabetes who also have Parkinson's disease. Um, thyroid function tests, such as a thyroid stimulating hormone, a free T4 or a free T3, might be ordered to assess thyroid function. Hypothyroidism can sometimes present with symptoms that overlap with those of Parkinson's disease. So ruling out thyroid dysfunction may be important. Some studies have suggested a possible link between low vitamin D levels and Parkinson's disease, although the exact nature of this association is still being investigated. A trial of levodopa, a medication commonly used to treat Parkinson's disease, may be initiated to assess the response of motor symptoms to levodopa, and this can be supportive of a Parkinson's disease diagnosis if there is a significant improvement in symptoms. The use of this medication trial is based on the fact that certain medications that increase dopamine levels in the brain, known as dopaminergic medications, can improve motor symptoms in patients with Parkinson's disease. A positive response to dopaminergic medication alone is not sufficient for a definitive diagnosis of Parkinson's, as other conditions may also respond to the dopaminergic medication, and the patient may need to be monitored for a period of time to further evaluate their response to the dopaminergic medication and to observe the progression of motor symptoms. As a nurse caring for a patient with Parkinson's disease, there are several assessments that should be performed to ensure comprehensive care. These assessments may include a physical assessment, including the overall physical condition, vital signs, general appearance, and the nurse should assess for any signs of motor symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease. A neurological assessment involves assessing the patient's cognitive function, speech and language, sensation, coordination, and reflexes. The nurse should also assess for any signs of cognitive impairment, mood changes, or behavioral symptoms. Since patients with Parkinson's disease are often prescribed multiple medications to manage their symptoms, it's important for the nurse to assess the patient's medication regimen for understanding, compliance, or any adverse effects or medication interactions. Parkinson's disease can impact a patient's ability to perform activities of daily living independently. The nurse should assess the patient's ability to perform ADLs such as dressing, grooming, bathing, eating, and toileting. Due to the motor symptoms and postural instability associated with the disease, patients may be at an increased risk of falls. The nurse should assess the patient's risk for falls using a validated fall risk assessment tool and implement appropriate fall prevention measures as needed. Parkinson's disease can also affect a patient's ability to maintain adequate nutrition. The nurse should assess the patient's nutritional status, including weight, appetite, dietary intake, and hydration. Parkinson's disease can have significant psychosocial impacts on patients and their families. The nurse should assess for emotional well-being, coping mechanisms, support system, and quality of life. Due to the risk of falls, impaired mobility, and other motor symptoms, the nurse should assess the patient's home environment for safety hazards and any modifications or adaptations that may be needed to ensure a safe living environment. Parkinson's disease can also impact a patient's ability to communicate effectively. The nurse should assess the patient's speech and language function and collaborate with a speech-language pathologist if needed to develop strategies to improve communication. 
Finally, it's important to assess the patient's caregiver if that's applicable. This includes assessing the caregiver's ability to provide care, their level of understanding about Parkinson's disease, and their own physical and emotional well-being. In Parkinson's disease, there may be certain vital sign changes that can be observed. These include hypotension. It's a common finding attributed to autonomic dysfunction. It can result in dizziness, lightheadedness, or fainting. The autonomic dysfunction can also result in bradycardia. This can be asymptomatic or may cause symptoms such as fatigue, weakness, or palpitations. Respiratory rate is not typically affected directly, but in advanced states, impaired motor function and rigidity may affect the patient's ability to take deep breaths or cough effectively. Body temperature is not typically affected by Parkinson's, but patients in advanced states may not be able to perform activities that help regulate body temperature, such as putting on or removing clothing. In advanced stages of Parkinson's, respiratory muscle weakness can occur, leading to reduced efficiency of breathing and decreased lung capacity, which can result in reduced oxygen saturation levels. Changes in oxygen saturation levels may also occur during episodes of dyskinesias. These are involuntary movements that can occur as a side effect of long-term levodopa use in Parkinson's disease. It's important to note, not all patients with Parkinson's disease will exhibit significant changes in vital signs, and the severity of these changes may vary depending on the stage of the disease and other individual factors. Tremors are one of the hallmark motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. They are involuntary rhythmic movements that typically occur at rest and often affect the extremities such as the hands, fingers, legs, or jaw. Tremors in Parkinson's disease are called resting tremors because they tend to diminish or disappear during voluntary movement and they become more prominent when the affected body, party, body part is at rest. They're often described as a pill rolling motion where the fingers or thumb repeatedly rub against each other or make circular movements. This resembles the motion of rolling a small pill between the fingers. However, they can also present in other forms such as fine trembling or shaking of the hands or fingers. Not all patients with Parkinson's exhibit tremors. The presentation of motor symptoms can vary from person to person. Tremors vary in severity and frequency, and they may change over time as the disease progresses. Muscle rigidity is another common motor symptom. This refers to increased resistance to passive movement of the muscles. This can cause stiffness, tension, a feeling of tightness in the affected muscles, and it can occur in any muscle group, but is often most noticeable in the limbs, neck, and trunk. This can present in different forms. Lead pipe rigidity refers to a constant resistance to passive movement of the muscles where the limb feels uniformly stiff throughout the entire range of motion. Hogwheel rigidity refers to a ratchety or jerky resistance to passive movement with a sensation of the muscles clicking or catching during the range of motion. Rigidity can also cause postural abnormalities such as stooped posture or loss of normal arm swing during walking. This rigidity can significantly impact a patient's mobility, flexibility, and quality of life and can cause difficulties with movement, fine motor tasks, and activities of daily living. It can also lead to discomfort, pain, and an increased risk of falls. Bradykinesia, also known as slowness of movement, is another hallmark motor symptom. This is a decrease in the ability to initiate, execute, and complete voluntary movements, which results in reduced speed and amplitude of movements. It can manifest in various ways, depending on the affected muscle groups. It can affect fine motor skills or gross motor movements. Common manifestations include difficulty with tasks that require fine motor coordination, such as buttoning a shirt, riding, or manipulating small objects. It can also affect larger movements such as walking, getting up from a chair, or turning in bed. It can also cause a decreased arm swing while walking, reduced facial expressions called a masked face, or monotone speech. Patients may have difficulty initiating movement, and movements may become progressively slower and smaller as the disease progresses. Postural instability is another commonly exhibited motor symptom. This is a reduced ability to maintain a steady and balanced posture and results in impaired balance and increased risk of falls. The postural instability can manifest in several ways. They may have difficulty maintaining an upright posture. They may exhibit stooped posture or a forward leaning position. They may have difficulty adjusting their posture to changes in the environment such as uneven surfaces or changes in body position. 
This can lead to a higher risk of falls, especially during activities that require complex movements, such as turning or change in direction while walking. This can result in reduced mobility, increased dependency on assistive devices, and decreased ability to perform activities of daily living independently. Assessment tools such as the Berg Balance Scale or the Timed Up and Go or Tug Test can be utilized to quantify postural instability and monitor changes over time. Freezing episodes, also known as freezing of gait, is another distinctive motor symptom. This is sudden episodes of difficulty initiating or maintaining normal walking or movement despite the intention to move. During freezing episodes, patients may experience a sudden temporary freeze or hesitation in their movements, as if their feet are glued to the floor. They may be unable to take a step or may take small shuffling steps. Freezing episodes are typically brief, lasting a few seconds to a few minutes, but they can be distressing, and they greatly impact a patient's mobility and quality of life. In addition to the neurodegenerative changes, other factors such as anxiety, stress, fatigue, and even environmental cues such as narrow spaces or doorways can trigger or exacerbate freezing episodes. Assessment tools such as the Freezing of Gate questionnaire may be used to gather additional information and quantify the frequency and severity of freezing episodes. Parkinson's disease can impact cognitive function, which involves mental processes such as memory, attention, problem solving and decision making. Symptoms range from mild cognitive impairment, a subtle decline in cognitive function that's noticeable but does not interfere significantly with daily activities, to Parkinson's disease dementia, which involves more severe cognitive deficits that impact daily functioning. Patients may experience difficulties with memory, executive function, attention, and processing speed. Patients with Parkinson's disease exhibit difficulties in various aspects of executive function. It can impact the ability to plan and organize daily activities. Patients may struggle with initiating and completing tasks in a sequential and organized manner. Patients may experience difficulties in initiating tasks, responding to environmental cues, or engaging in spontaneous activities. Patients can also struggle with the ability to shift between tasks flexibly. These difficulties in switching between different tasks or activities can lead to inflexibility and rigidity in their behavior. Parkinson's can affect problem-solving abilities, leading to difficulties in identifying and implementing solutions to challenges or difficulties. It can also impact decision-making abilities, including difficulties in evaluating and weighing different options, considering consequences, and making appropriate choices. These difficulties in executive function can have a significant impact on a patient's daily life, including their ability to manage their self-care, engage in activities of daily living, and participate in social and recreational activities. It can also impact their ability to manage their disease, such as adhering to medication schedules, keeping appointments, or managing symptoms. Management of executive function difficulties may involve strategies such as simplifying routines, breaking down tasks into smaller steps, providing cues and prompts to initiate activities, and utilizing visual aids or checklists. Occupational therapy or cognitive rehabilitation may also be considered to help patients develop strategies to compensate for executive function deficits. Patients may be more susceptible to distractions and have reduced ability to filter out irrelevant information, attentional deficits Deficits can manifest in various aspects of daily life, such as difficulties in reading, following conversations, or engaging in complex tasks that require sustained attention and concentration. Patients may also experience increased mental fatigue or reduced mental stamina, which can further impact their attention and concentration abilities. Management of attention and concentration difficulties in Parkinson's disease may involve strategies such as providing a conducive environment with minimal distractions, breaking down tasks into smaller, manageable steps and providing regular breaks to reduce mental fatigue. Medication management may also be considered to help improve attention and concentration abilities. Patients may experience difficulties in various aspects of memory, including short-term memory, long-term memory, and working memory. Short-term memory refers to the ability to hold and manipulate information in the mind over brief periods of time, such as remembering a phone number or a short list of items. Long-term memory refers to the ability to store and retrieve information over longer periods of time, such as recalling past events or personal experiences. 
Working memory refers to the ability to temporarily hold and manipulate information in the mind for ongoing tasks, such as following instructions or solving problems. Patients with Parkinson's disease may have difficulties in, in encoding new information into memory, as well as retrieving previously stored information. They may experience forgetfulness, difficulty in recalling names, dates, or events, and difficulty in learning new tasks or skills. These memory deficits can impact the patient's daily life and may affect their ability to perform the activities of daily living, engage in hobbies, or participate in social interactions. Management of memory deficits in Parkinson's disease may involve strategies such as providing memory aids, such as calendars or reminders, optimizing the patient's environment to reduce distractions, and providing cognitive rehabilitation or memory training programs. Medication management may also be considered. Patients with Parkinson's disease may experience difficulties in various aspects of visuospatial functions. They may have difficulties judging distances accurately, perceiving depth or spatial relationships correctly, and understanding spatial orientation, such as getting lost or disoriented in familiar surroundings. They may also have difficulties with tasks that require visuospatial coordination, such as driving, reading maps, or assembling objects. Management of visual and spatial deficits may involve strategies such as providing environmental modifications to reduce visual distractions or hazards, providing visual aids or cues to assist with spatial orientation, and providing rehabilitation or training programs to improve visual and spatial skills. Occupational therapists or other specialists may also be involved in providing interventions to optimize visual and spatial function. One of the hallmark speech characteristics is hypokinetic dysarthria, which is characterized by reduced vocal loudness, monotone speech, and reduced articulation precision. Speech can be soft, mumbled, and difficult to understand. Patients may also have difficulties with voice pitch modulation, resulting in a monotonous speech pattern. Additionally, patients may experience reduced facial expression, including reduced movements of the lips, tongue, and jaw, which can further impact speech clarity. Language difficulties may also occur, although they are typically less prominent than speech difficulties. Patients may have difficulties finding the right words, organizing their thoughts, or maintaining appropriate grammar and syntax. These language difficulties may result in decreased verbal fluency, reduced ability to express oneself effectively, and difficulties with comprehension and understanding of spoken or written language. Management of speech and language difficulties may involve speech and language therapy to improve vocal loudness, articulation precision, voice pitch modulation, and overall communication skills. Strategies may include exercises to strengthen vocal muscles, training in breath support and voice projection, and techniques to improve articulation and fluency. Speech language pathologists may also work with patients to improve language skills, such as word finding, organizing thoughts, and maintaining appropriate grammar and syntax. One of the sensory symptoms that may be experienced is altered sensation or sensory disturbances, such as tingling, numbness, or a feeling of pins and needles in certain parts of the body. Some patients may also report a reduced ability to feel sensations, such as touch or temperature in affected areas. The disease can also impact proprioception. This is the ability to perceive the position and movement of one's own body in space. Proprioception is an important sensory function that helps with balance, coordination, and body awareness. Proprioceptive deficits can result in difficulties with balance and coordination, leading to postural instability and increased risk of falls. Management of sensory disturbances and proprioceptive deficits may involve various interventions. For, abnorm for abnormal sensations, treat the underlying cause if identified. For example, if a patient has peripheral neuropathy contributing to the abnormal sensations, manage the neuropathy. Occupational and physical therapy may be helpful in addressing proprioceptive deficits, improving balance, and coordination. A hallmark motor symptom is bradykinesia. This can affect coordination as it results in difficulty initiating and executing smooth and coordinated movements. Movements may become slow, jerky. Patients may struggle with tasks that require precise coordination, such as buttoning a shirt, tying shoelaces, or handling small objects. Muscle rigidity, another common motor symptom, can also impact coordination as it impedes the smooth execution of coordinated movements and results in a decrease in overall motor performance. 
Postural instability can affect coordination as patients experience unsteadiness, loss of balance, and an increased risk of falls. And this can disrupt coordinated movements and impair overall motor function. Management of coordination deficits may involve medications such as levodopa, dopamine agonists, or other anti-Parkinsonian medications. And these can help improve coordination by alleviating the bradykinesia and muscle rigidity. Physical and occupational therapy may also be beneficial in, in improving coordination, balance, and fun functional mobility. Reflexes that rely on normal tone and flexibility of muscles, such as stretch reflexes, may be affected by muscle rigidity. This results in altered reflex responses. It's worth noting that reflexes can also be impacted by medications used to manage the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Some anti-Parkinsonian medications, such as dopamine agonists or levodopa, can affect reflexes due to their effects on the central nervous system. These medications can enhance or diminish reflex responses depending on the medication, dosage, and individual patient response. Parkinson's disease can also impact mood, and emotional well-being. Mood changes are common in Parkinson's disease and can significantly impact the quality of life for individuals living with the condition. It's estimated that up to 50% of individuals with Parkinson's may experience depression at some point. Symptoms may include persistent feelings of sadness, loss of interest or pleasure in activities, changes in appetite or weight, sleep disturbances, feelings of guilt or worthlessness, fatigue, and difficulty concentrating or making decisions. Anxiety can manifest as excessive worry, restlessness, irritability, and a sense of unease or fear. It can be triggered by the uncertainties associated with living with a chronic illness, the challenges of managing the motor symptoms, and concerns about the future. Apathy is a lack of motivation, interest, or enthusiasm towards activities or life in general. It can manifest as a loss of initiative, reduced engagement in previously enjoyed activities, and a general sense of indifference or disinterest. It can impact a person's motivation to participate in their own self-care and management of their disease, and can also affect relationships with family and friends. Patients may have abrupt changes in mood that may range from periods of irritability or anger to episodes of crying or laughing without an apparent cause. Mood swings can be distressing for individual patients, as well as for their caregivers and loved ones. Psychosis refers to a loss of contact with reality and can involve hallucinations, seeing or hearing things that are not there, or delusions, false beliefs or perceptions. Psychosis can occur in advanced stages of the disease and may require additional medical intervention and management. Patients can have behavioral symptoms. These are changes in an individual's behavior, emotions, and social interactions. And these can vary widely among individuals. Parkinson's can in impact impulsivity and impulse control, leading to changes in an individual's ability to control their behaviors, emotions, and impulses. Impulsivity refers to acting on impulses without considering the consequences. Impulsivity may manifest as impulsive spending, gambling, or engaging in risky behaviors without fully evaluating the potential risks or outcomes. This can result in financial difficulties, strained relationships, and other adverse consequences. Parkinson's can also impair impulse control, leading to difficulties in inhibiting inappropriate behaviors or emotions or speech patterns. This can result in impulsive actions, emotional outbursts, or difficulty restraining oneself from engaging in behaviors or comments that can be socially or personally inappropriate. Impulsivity and impaired impulse control can be caused by the dopamine changes in the brain because they play a crucial role in regulating motivation, reward, and impulse control, but they may also be associated with the use of dopamine replacement therapy, such as levodopa, which is commonly prescribed to manage motor symptoms. Dopamine replacement therapies can sometimes result in side effects, including impulsivity, impaired impulse control, and compulsive behaviors. Compulsivity refers to repetitive, often excessive and uncontrollable engagement in specific behaviors despite negative consequences. Compulsive behaviors can manifest as repetitive actions or rituals, such as compulsive hand washing, checking or ordering, as well as compulsive eating, gambling, shopping, or other repetitive behaviors. And again, this can be caused by either the neurochemical changes in the brain or as side effects of medication. 
It's important to note, not all individuals with Parkinson's will develop compulsive behaviors. The risk factors for compulsivity in Parkinson's disease are complex and multifactorial. But certain factors such as a history of impulsive or compulsive behaviors, a family history of compulsive disorders, younger age at disease onset, and higher doses of dopaminergic medications have been identified as potential risk factors for the development of compulsive behaviors in individuals with Parkinson's. ADLs are the basic self-care tasks that individuals perform on a daily basis to take care of their personal needs and maintain independence. In Parkinson's disease, motor symptoms such as bradykinesia, rigidity, and postural instability can significantly impact a person's ability to perform ADLs. Here are some common ADLs and considerations for assessing them in these patients. Personal hygiene. This includes tasks such as bathing, grooming, brushing hair or shaving, and oral care, brushing teeth. Assess the patient's ability to independently perform these tasks, including any difficulties with fine motor skills, coordination, or balance. Dressing. Assess the patient's ability to put on and take off clothing independently, including buttons, zippers, and fasteners. Note any difficulties with fine motor skills, dexterity, or coordination. Eating. Assess the patient's ability to handle utensils, cut food, and feed themselves independently. Note any difficulties with tremors, rigidity, or bradykinesia that may impact their ability to perform these tasks. Toileting. Assess the patient's ability to independently use the toilet, including transferring on and off the toilet, managing their clothing, and maintaining their hygiene. Note any difficulties with mobility, balance, or fine motor skills. Mobility. Assess the patient's ability to move around and perform transfers independently, such as getting in and out of bed, standing up from a chair, or walking. Note any difficulties with balance, gait, or coordination. Instrumental activities of daily living, or IADLs, these are more complex tasks that are necessary for independent living, such as managing finances, preparing meals, managing medications, and housekeeping. Assess the patient's ability to perform these tasks independently and know any difficulties with cognitive function, motor skills, or coordination. It's important to observe the patient's performance of ADLs in their usual environment. Take into consideration any environmental modifications or assistive devices they might be using. The assessment can be done through direct observation, interviewing the patient and their caregivers, or using standardized assessment tools, such as the CATS Index of Independence and Activities of Daily Living, or the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. Assessing nutrition is an important aspect of overall care, as Parkinson's disease can affect various aspects of a person's ability to eat and maintain proper nutrition. Here are some things you should consider. Appetite and food intake. Assess the patient's appetite and food intake, including any changes in appetite or eating patterns. Parkinson's disease can affect the sense of smell and taste, which may impact a person's appetite, and motor symptoms can affect a person's ability to eat and may reduce in, result in reduced food intake. Assess for any recent changes in the patient's weight, both unintentional weight loss and weight gain. Unintentional weight loss can be indicative of inadequate nutrient intake or increased energy expenditure due to disease progression while weight gain may be related to reduced physical activity or changes in medication. Assess the patient's nutrient intake, including the types of foods consumed, portion sizes, and frequency of meals and snacks. Consider whether the patient is consuming a balanced and varied diet that meets their nutritional needs, including adequate intake of protein, vitamins, minerals, and fiber. Assess the patient's fluid intake, as dehydration can be a concern due to reduced thirst perception, impaired swallowing, and medication side effects. Adequate hydration is important for overall health and can help prevent issues such as constipation and orthostatic hypotension. Assess for any difficulties with swallowing, as dysphagia is common in Parkinson's and can lead to aspiration, pneumonia, and other complications. Observe the patient during meals for signs of choking, coughing, or difficulty swallowing, and ask about any symptoms of dysphagia, such as drooling or food getting stuck in the throat. 
Assess the patient's medication regimen and potential interactions with nutrition. Some medications may need to be taken with food to enhance absorption, while others may interact with certain nutrients or require adjustments in the timing of meals. Assess the patient's oral health, including dental hygiene, oral infections, and denture fit. Parkinson's can affect oral motor function, saliva production, and swallowing, which can impact a person's ability to maintain good oral health and proper chewing. Assess for any gastrointestinal symptoms, such as constipation, nausea, or bloating, which are common in Parkinson's and can affect nutrition. Consider interventions to manage these symptoms, such as dietary changes, increased fluid intake, or medications if needed. Parkinson's disease is not only a movement disorder, but also a complex neurodegenerative condition that can have a significant impact on a person's mental health, emotional well-being, social interactions, and overall quality of life. There are some key areas that need to be assessed. Evaluate the patient's emotional well-being, including their mood, anxiety, and depression symptoms. Parkinson's is associated with an increased risk of mood disorders such as depression and anxiety, which can have a significant impact on the patient's quality of life. So assess the patient's symptoms, their coping mechanisms, and any history of mental health conditions. Assess the patient's perception of their quality of life and how Parkinson's disease has affected their daily activities, their social interactions, or overall well-being. Consider their ability to perform activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, and engage in leisure activities, hobbies, and social interactions. Evaluate the patient's social support system. This includes family, friends, and other caregivers. Parkinson's disease can affect a person's ability to engage in social activities, and social support can play a crucial role in their emotional well-being and coping with the challenges of the disease. Assess the patient's level of social support, availability of caregivers, and potential sources of emotional support. Assess the patient's cognitive function, including their memory, attention, and executive function. Parkinson's impacts cognitive function, as we've talked about before, so it's important to assess any cognitive changes that may affect the patient's daily activities, decision-making, and ability to communicate effectively. Remember, always evaluate the impact of the disease on the patient's caregivers, including their physical, emotional, and social well-being. Caregivers often face significant challenges in managing the care of their loved ones, and assessing caregiver burden and providing support can be an important aspect of psychosocial assessment. Assess the patient's coping strategies and adaptive mechanisms for dealing with the challenges of Parkinson's disease. Evaluate their level of resilience, problem-solving skills, and ability to cope with stress and changes in their physical and emotional health. Evaluate the patient's health beliefs and behaviors, including their understanding of the disease, adherence to medication and treatment regimens, and engagement in self-care activities. Assess their level of health literacy, their motivation for self-care, and their willingness to participate in treatment plans. Discuss the patient's advanced care planning wishes, including their preferences for end-of-life care, advanced directives, and communication with family members and healthcare providers about their care preferences. Parkinson's is a progressive condition. Discussing advanced care planning early on can help to ensure that the patient's wishes are respected and their end-of-life care preferences are honored. Check in with your patient frequently as the disease progresses, they may have different ideas about what they would like for end of life. Assessing and addressing safety issues can help prevent injuries and improve the overall well-being of patients. Evaluate the patient's risk of falls by assessing their mobility, balance, gait, and coordination. The motor symptoms associated with Parkinson's can increase the risk of falls. Assess the patient's ability to perform functional activities, such as standing, walking, turning, and transferring, and identify any factors that may increase their fall risk, such as muscle weakness, impaired balance, or medication side effects. Assess the patient's home environment for potential safety hazards, such as tripping hazards, poor lighting, uneven surfaces, and obstacles. Evaluate the patient's living situation, including their home layout, accessibility, and safety features, such as grab bars, handrails, and non-slip surfaces. Identify any modifications or adaptations that may be needed to improve the safety of the home environment.
Review the patient's current medications, including Parkinson's disease medications and any other medications they might be taking for other health conditions. Evaluate the appropriateness of the medication regimen, dosages, and potential interactions or side effects that may impact the patient's safety. Assess the patient's adherence to their medication regimen and provide education on the importance of taking medications as prescribed. Evaluate the patient's use of assistive devices such as canes, walkers, or other mobility aids and assess their effectiveness improving the patient's mobility and safety. Provide recommendations for appropriate assistive devices based on the patient's needs and functional abilities. Assess the patient's driving abilities, including their reaction time, coordination, visual acuity, and cognitive function. Parkinson's disease can affect a person's ability to drive safely, and it may be necessary to evaluate their driving skills and provide recommendations for safe driving or alternative transportation options if needed. Provide education and training to the patient and their caregivers on safety measures such as fall prevention strategies, home safety tips, medication management, and strategies to manage motor symptoms that can impact safety such as freezing of gait or dyskinesia. Assess the role of caregivers in the patient's care. Provide support and education on safety measures that they can implement to assist the patient in maintaining their safety at home and in the community. This may include providing education on fall prevention, assisting with medication management, and encouraging the patient to engage in safe activities. Parkinson's disease can affect the muscles used for speech and voice production, leading to changes in speech volume, pitch, articulation, and intelligibility. So there are some key assessments that need to be made. Assess the patient's speech production, including speech volume, pitch, rate, and rhythm. Parkinson's disease can cause hypokinetic dysarthria, which is characterized by reduced vocal loudness, monotone or low pitch voice, and imprecise articulation. Evaluate the patient's ability to articulate speech sounds clearly, produce fluent speech, and maintain appropriate speech rate and rhythm. Assess the patient's voice quality, pitch, and volume. Parkinson's disease can cause changes in vocal fold tension, leading to a breathy or a hoarse voice quality reduced pitch variability, and reduced vocal volume. Evaluate the patient's ability to modulate their voice pitch, volume, and quality during speech, and their ability to project their voice effectively for communication. Assess the patient's language abilities, including their comprehension, expression, reading, and writing skills. Parkinson's can affect language processing, leading to difficulties with word finding, sentence construction, and comprehension of complex language. Evaluate the patient's ability to understand spoken and written language, express their thoughts and ideas clearly, and engage in effective conversation. Assess the patient's nonverbal communication skills, including their ability to use facial expressions, gestures, and body language to convey meaning. Parkinson's disease can impact the patient's ability to use nonverbal cues effectively. This can affect their overall communication abilities. Evaluate the patient's ability to use appropriate nonverbal cues to enhance their communication and understand nonverbal cues from others. Assess the patient's swallowing function as swallowing difficulties, dysphagia, that's dysphagia with a G, can occur in advanced stages of Parkinson's disease and impact speech and communication. Evaluate the patient's ability to safely and effectively swallow food and liquids and identify any signs of swallowing difficulties such as coughing, choking, or changes in voice or speech after swallowing. Assess the patient's emotional well-being as mood changes such as depression and anxiety can affect communication abilities. Evaluate the patient's emotional state, level of distress, and any impact on their communication skills. Parkinson's disease is a chronic and progressive condition that requires ongoing care, and caregivers play a crucial role in managing the physical, emotional, and daily living needs of the person with Parkinson's. Caregiver assessments are important to ensure that caregivers are coping well, have adequate support, and are able to continue providing care effectively. Caregivers may experience physical health challenges due to the demands of caregiving, such as lifting and transferring the person with Parkinson's, assisting with mobility, 
managing medication schedules and dealing with sleep disturbances. Assess the caregiver's physical health, including any chronic health conditions, injuries, or physical limitations that may impact their ability to provide care. Caregiving can have a significant emotional impact on caregivers, including feelings of stress, anxiety, depression, and caregiver burden. Assess the caregiver's emotional well-being, including their level of distress, symptoms of anxiety or depression, and any signs of caregiver burnout. Evaluate their coping strategies, social support, and self-care practices. Caregivers may require social support to cope with the demands of caregiving, such as assistance from family members, friends, or other support systems. Assess the caregiver's social support network, including their access to emotional, practical, and financial support. Evaluate the level of satisfaction with their social support and identify any gaps or needs. Assess the caregiver's understanding of the tasks and responsibilities involved in caregiving for a person with Parkinson's. Evaluate their ability to manage tasks such as medication management, mobility assistance, meal preparation, hygiene care, and communication support. Identify any challenges or areas that might require additional training or support. Caregiving can be physically and emotionally demanding. So caregivers may experience strain or burden related to their caregiving responsibilities. Assess the caregiver's perception of caregiver strain, including their level of burden, the impact on their quality of life, and any signs of caregiver fatigue or overwhelm. Assess the caregiver's knowledge about the disease and knowledge about available resources for them, such as support groups, educational materials, and community services. Evaluate their awareness of strategies for managing disease symptoms, dealing with challenges, and accessing appropriate resources for support. Caregivers may neglect their own self-care needs while providing care to someone with Parkinson's. Assess the caregiver's self-care practices, including their ability to engage in regular self-care activities such as exercise, proper nutrition, sleep, and leisure time. Identify any barriers to self-care and provide recommendations for improvement. The medical management of Parkinson's disease typically involves a multidisciplinary approach, including medication management, physical and occupational therapy, and lifestyle modifications. The main goals of medical management in Parkinson's disease are to relieve symptoms, improve quality of life, and slow down the progression of the disease. The specific medical management plan may vary depending on the severity of the disease, the age and overall health of the patient, and other individual factors. Medications are the cornerstone of managing Parkinson's disease. There are several classes of medications that are commonly used in the medical management of Parkinson's. The choice of medications, dosage, and timing of administration may vary depending on the severity of the disease, the age, and overall health of the patient, and other individual factors. We're just going to touch on these here, and we'll go into them in more detail in a bit. Levodopa is the most effective medication for managing the motor symptoms. It is converted into dopamine in the brain and helps replenish the dopamine that is depleted in Parkinson's. Levodopa is usually combined with a peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor, such as carbidopa or benzerazide, to prevent its breakdown in the bloodstream and to enhance its delivery to the brain. Levodopa is available in various formulations, including immediate release, controlled release, and orally disintegrating forms, which allow for individualized dosing regimens. Dopamine agonists are medications that directly stimulate dopamine receptors in the brain. They can be used as monotherapy or in combination with levodopa to manage the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Dopamine agonists are available in different forms, such as oral tablets, extended release tablets, and patches, and include medications such as pramipexol, ropinirol, rotigotine, and apomorphine. Monoamine oxidase B, MAOB, inhibitors are medications that block the activity of the enzyme MAOB, which breaks down dopamine in the brain. By inhibiting MAOB, these medications help increase the levels of dopamine in the brain and can be used as monotherapy or in combination with levodopa to manage motor symptoms. Examples of MAOB inhibitors used in Parkinson's disease include selegiline and resagiline. 
Catechol-O-methyltransferase, COMT, inhibitors are medications that block the activity of the enzyme COMT, which breaks down levodopa in the bloodstream. By inhibiting COMT, these medications help prolong the duration of action of levodopa and reduce motor fluctuations. COMT inhibitors, such as entacapone and tolcapone, are typically used in combination with levodopa. Anticholinergic medications are used to manage the tremors and rigidity associated with Parkinson's. They work by blocking the action of acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter that is in excess in Parkinson's disease due to the depletion of dopamine. Anticholinergics such as trihexaphenidyl and benzotropine are typically used in younger patients with tremor-dominant Parkinson's disease. Amantadine is a medication that has both dopaminergic and anticholinergic properties. It is used to manage the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, particular dyskinesias, abnormal involuntary movements that are associated with levodopa therapy. Amantadine can also help improve rigidity and bradykinesia. It is important to note that medication management in Parkinson's is highly individualized. The specific medications, Doses and timing will vary depending on the patient's unique needs, stage of disease, and response to treatment. Medications may be adjusted over time to optimize symptom control and minimize side effects. Physical and occupational therapy can help manage the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, improve mobility, balance, and coordination, and enhance the patient's overall quality of life. Physical therapy may include a range of exercises and activities tailored to the individual's needs and capabilities, such as gait training, strength training, balance exercises, coordination exercises, and flexibility exercises. Physical therapists may also provide education and guidance on strategies to manage motor symptoms, optimize mobility and safety, and reduce the risk of falls. Occupational therapy focuses on helping individuals maintain or regain their ability to perform activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living, such as bathing, grooming, eating, dressing, cooking, and managing household tasks. Occupational therapists can assess the individual's functional abilities and provide strategies and interventions to improve independence, safety, and quality of life. This may include recommendations for adaptive equipment, modifications to the home environment, and techniques to conserve energy and optimize movement. Occupational therapists may also address cognitive and perceptual changes that can occur in Parkinson's disease, such as difficulties with planning, organization, or problem solving. Exercise is an important component of the medical management of Parkinson's. Regular physical activity and exercise have been shown to have numerous benefits, including improving physical function, mobility, strength, balance, and overall well-being. Exercise programs may include aerobic exercise, such as walking, biking, or dancing, as well as specific exercises to target motor symptoms, such as stretching, strengthening, and balance exercises. Exercise programs can be tailored to the individual's abilities, preferences, and disease stage, and may be supervised by physical therapists or other healthcare providers. Lifestyle modifications, such as regular exercise, a healthy diet, and adequate sleep can be beneficial for managing Parkinson's. Good nutrition and a healthy diet are an important lifestyle modification. Some individuals may experience difficulties with chewing or swallowing, and this can affect their ability to eat a balanced diet. Some may have interactions with certain foods or require special timing in relation to meals. Working with a registered dietitian can help patients develop a healthy eating plan that meets their specific needs and addresses any dietary concerns or restrictions. Sleep disturbances such as insomnia or excessive daytime sleepiness are common. Good sleep hygiene practices such as establishing a regular sleep schedule, creating a comfortable sleep environment, and avoiding stimulants before bedtime can be important lifestyle modifications to promote better sleep. If sleep disturbances persist, it's important to consult a healthcare professional for further evaluation and management. Managing stress is important. Stress can exacerbate motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Finding effective stress management techniques, such as relaxation techniques, mindfulness, or counseling, can help individuals with Parkinson's disease better cope with the challenges of living with a chronic condition. 
Individuals with Parkinson's are at increased risk of falls due to motor symptoms, balance impairments, and other factors. So fall prevention strategies include home modifications to reduce fall hazards, such as removing clutter, improving lighting, and installing handrails, using assistive devices such as canes or walkers as needed, and participating in balance exercises or physical therapy to help improve, imba improve balance and reduce fall risk. Living with a chronic condition like Parkinson's disease can be challenging. Having a support system in place, such as family, friends, support groups, or counseling, can help individuals with Parkinson's better cope with the emotional and social aspects of the condition. Parkinson's disease can affect speech and swallowing function in some patients. So speech therapy can help individuals with Parkinson's improve their speech by addressing issues such as vocal loudness, voice quality, speech rate and articulation. Speech language pathologists, SLPs, can provide exercises and techniques to help strengthen the muscles used for speech, improve breath control, and enhance vocal projection. SLPs can also provide strategies for effective communication, such as pacing speech, using visual cues, and enhancing nonverbal communication to improve communication skills and overcome speech difficulties associated with Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> Swallowing therapy, also known as dysphagia therapy, can help individuals with Parkinson's disease improve their swallowing abilities and reduce the risk of complications. SLPs can evaluate swallowing function, provide exercises and techniques to strengthen swallowing muscles, and provide recommendations for modifications to food and liquid consistencies, eating techniques, and mealtime strategies to improve swallowing safety and efficiency. Speech and swallowing therapy can also provide patients with strategies to improve communication and swallowing safety in daily life. This may include strategies such as using communication aids or devices, optimizing posture during meals, or modifying food textures to reduce the risk of choking or aspiration. Speech and swallowing therapy may also include education and counseling. It could be providing information on the disease, its impact on speech and swallowing, and strategies for managing speech and swallowing difficulties at home. Counseling may also be provided to address the emotional and psychological aspects related to changes in speech and swallowing, such as frustration, embarrassment, or anxiety. Speech and, speech and swallowing therapy may include home exercise programs to reinforce therapy techniques and exercises learned during therapy sessions. These home exercise programs may be customized to the individual's needs, abilities, and disease stage, and may be designed to be integrated into the individual's daily routine to promote optimal outcomes. Parkinson's can have a significant impact on a patient's mental health, leading to anxiety, depression, and other mood changes, so psychological support can provide emotional support to help individuals cope with these emotions, express their concerns and fears, or develop coping strategies to manage the emotional impact of the disease. This may involve individual counseling, support groups, or family therapy, depending on the individual's needs and preferences. Psychological support can provide cognitive and behavioral support through strategies to manage cognitive changes, such as memory exercises, cognitive training, and techniques to improve executive function. Behavioral support may also involve addressing issues such as impulse control disorders, apathy, and mood changes. Coping strategies can empower individuals with Parkinson's to better manage their symptoms, improve their emotional resilience, and enhance their overall well-being. Providing education and information about Parkinson's, its symptoms, progression, and management strategies can help patients and their caregivers understand the disease better, anticipate and manage changes, and make informed decisions about care. And psychological support can provide caregivers with support, education, and coping strategies to manage the emotional burden, stress, and challenges of caregiving and promote well-being. Because Parkinson's disease is a progressive condition, the management plan may need to be regularly reviewed and adjusted based on the patient's changing needs and disease progression. Regular follow-up appointments with the healthcare provider, monitoring of symptoms, medication side effects, and adjustments in medication doses or regimens may be necessary to optimize symptom management. In some cases, surgical interventions may be considered for patients with advanced Parkinson's disease who do not respond adequately to medica medication therapy.
Deep brain stimulation, DBS, is a surgical procedure in which electrodes are implanted into specific regions of the brain. These electrodes are connected to a pulse generator or brain pacemaker that is implemented, excuse me, that is implanted under the skin in the chest or abdominal area. The electrical impulses from the pulse generator modulate the abnormal brain activity associated with Parkinson's disease, helping to alleviate motor symptoms such as tremors, rigidity, and bradykinesia. DBS is typically considered for individuals who have Parkinson's with motor fluctuations and dyskinesias that are not well controlled with medications or who experience significant medication-related side effects. DBS is reversible and can be adjusted to optimize symptom control and has been shown to provide long-term benefit in selected cases. Lesioning procedures involve the use of focused heat or other forms of energy to create intentional damage to specific brain areas that are responsible for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. These procedures are typically performed using stereotactic techniques, which use precise imaging guidance to target specific brain areas. Lesioning procedures such as thaumatotomy or pallidotomy can be effective in alleviating tremors, rigidity, and other motor symptoms, but they are irreversible, and they carry risks of side effects or complications. So lesioning procedures are less commonly used compared to DBS, as DBS offers more flexibility in adjusting and titrating the treatment. Duodenal levodopa infusion is a relatively newer surgical intervention that involves the continuous delivery of levodopa, a key medication for Parkinson's, directly into the duodenum using a surgically implanted tube. The continuous infusion of levodopa bypasses the digestive system and helps to reduce fluctuations in levodopa levels in the blood, which can help to alleviate motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. Duodenal levodopa infusion is typically considered for individuals who have severe motor fluctuations and dyskinesias that are not well controlled with other treatments and who are not good candidates for DBS or other surgical interventions. Focused ultrasound is a non-invasive surgical intervention that uses high-frequency sound waves to create targeted lesions in specific brain areas responsible for motor symptoms of Parkinson's. It does not involve any incisions or implants, can be performed without anesthesia, but it is still considered experimental. It's not yet widely available, showing some promising initial results in some studies for alleviating motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. It's important to note, not all individuals with Parkinson's are candidates for surgical interventions, and the decision to undergo surgery is based on a thorough evaluation by a neurologist or movement disorder specialist, taking into consideration the individual's overall health, disease stage, and symptom profile. Risks, benefits, and potential complications of these surgical interventions should be carefully considered. The individual should be well-informed and involved in the decision-making process. Post-operative care and follow-up are important components of surgical interventions, and regular monitoring and adjustments may be needed to optimize outcomes and manage any potential complications. Nursing management for patients with Parkinson's typically involves a holistic approach that addresses the physical, emotional, and cognitive aspects of the disease. The primary goals of nursing care for patients with Parkinson's are to manage symptoms, promote independence, optimize quality of life, and provide education and support to the patient and their caregivers. Nursing assessment is crucial in identifying the patient's physical, emotional, and cognitive needs. Assessments may include evaluating the patient's motor symptoms, such as tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural instability. Assessing the patient's ability to perform activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living can help determine their level of independence and identify areas where support may be needed. Additionally, assessing the patient's emotional well-being, cognition, and communication abilities can help identify any changes or challenges related to the disease. Medications play a critical role in managing the symptoms of this disease. Nurses may be responsible for administering medications as prescribed, monitoring for adverse effects, and educating patients and caregivers on the importance of medication adherence. This may include educating patients about the different types of medications used, such as dopaminergic medications, anticholinergics, and other adjunctive medications. Parkinson's disease can affect a patient's balance, 
coordination, and gait, leading to an increased risk of falls. Nurses may assist patients in maintaining mobility and preventing falls by implementing strategies, such as providing assistive devices, such as canes or walkers, teaching safe transfer techniques, and promoting regular exercise and physical therapy. Environmental modifications, such as removing tripping hazards, improving lighting, and ensuring a safe living environment may also be implemented to reduce the risk of falls. Parkinson's disease can affect a patient's ability to chew and swallow, which can lead to nutritional deficiencies and aspiration risk. Nurses may assess and monitor the patient's ability to eat and swallow safely, provide dietary education, and collaborate with other healthcare professionals such as speech-language pathologists and dietitians to ensure the patient's nutritional needs are met. Parkinson's can affect a patient's speech and communication abilities due to changes in vocal volume, articulation, and swallowing. Nurses may work with speech-language pathologists to assess and manage speech and swallowing difficulties, provide education to patients and caregivers on communication strategies, and assist with the use of augmentative and alternative communication devices if needed. Parkinson's can have a significant emotional impact on patients and their caregivers. Nurses may provide emotional support to patients by addressing their emotional needs, providing education about coping strategies, and facilitating access to mental health services as needed. Supportive counseling, active listening, and empathy can play a crucial role in helping patients and their caregivers cope with the challenges of this disease. Patient and caregiver education is an essential component of nursing management. Nurses may provide education on the nature of the disease, its progression, symptom management, medication adherence, self-care strategies, and strategies to optimize quality of life. Nurses may also connect patients and caregivers to support groups, community resources, and other healthcare professionals to provide additional support and information. Nurses often work as part of an interdisciplinary team in the management of Parkinson's, collaborating with other healthcare professionals such as neurologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, social workers, and pharmacists is crucial to provide comprehensive care for these patients. Okay guys, I want you to make sure that you have six blank active learning templates for medications. We're going to get those filled out and you're going to have a really good understanding of specifically how these medications are used for treating Parkinson's disease. There are several classes of medications commonly used in the management of Parkinson's disease. Levodopa is considered the most effective medication for Parkinson's disease and is often used as a cornerstone of treatment. So, pharmacological action. Levodopa is a precursor of dopamine, a neurotransmitter that is deficient in Parkinson's disease. Once absorbed into the bloodstream, levodopa is transported into the brain, where it's converted into dopamine, helping to replenish dopamine levels and improve motor function. Therapeutic uses. Levodopa is used to manage the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, including tremors, rigidity, and bradykinesia. It can also help improve gait and balance in some patients. Levodopa is typically used in combination with other medications such as dopamine agonists, MAOB inhibitors, or COMT inhibitors to optimize symptom control. Complications. Levodopa can cause several complications, including motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. Motor fluctuations refers to changes in motor symptoms, such as periods of worsening symptoms called off periods, and periods of improved symptoms called on periods, which can occur as the disease progresses and levodopa's effectiveness fluctuates. Dyskinesias are abnormal involuntary movements that may develop as a side effect of levodopa therapy, and they can be bothersome and interfere with daily activities. Typical administration and dosage. Levodopa is typically administered orally as tablets or capsules, and the dosage is individualized based on the patient's symptoms, disease severity, and response to the medication. The dosing schedule and frequency may vary depending on the formulation of levodopa used, for example, immediate release or extended release, and the specific needs of the patient. Levodopa is usually started at a low dose and gradually increased to achieve optimal symptom control while minimizing side effects. And if you guys can hear my tower garden going off, I apologize, but I want to power through this and get you this information. Contraindications and precautions. Levodopa is generally contraindicated in patients with a history of hypersensitivity to levodopa or other ingredients in the medication, narrow angle glaucoma, or a history of melanoma. Levodopa should be used with caution in patients with a history of cardiovascular disease, 
liver or kidney impairment, endocrine disorders, or psychiatric disorders. It may interact with other medications and caution should be exercised when used in combination with other Parkinson's disease medications to avoid potential drug interactions. Interactions. Levodopa can interact with other medications, including other Parkinson's disease medications, and can cause potential interactions that may affect its effectiveness or increase the risk of side effects. As part of nursing management for patients taking levodopa, nursing interventions may include ensuring that levodopa is administered as prescribed, following the recommended dosage, timing, and route of administration, monitoring the patient for potential side effects and complications, such as motor fluctuations, dyskinesias, changes in blood pressure, heart rate, mental status, and other adverse reactions providing education to the patient and their caregivers about the purpose, dosage, administration, potential side effects, and precautions of levodopa, and ensuring that the patient understands the importance of adhering to the medication schedule and reporting any changes in symptoms or side effects to the healthcare provider, and evaluating the effectiveness of levodopa in managing the patient's motor symptoms and monitoring for changes in symptoms over time to help guide prescribing. Dopamine agonists are a class of medications used to manage the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Pharmacological action. Dopamine agonists work by binding to dopamine receptors in the brain and mimicking the action of dopamine, helping to replenish dopamine levels and improve motor function. Therapeutic uses. Dopamine agonists are used to manage the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, including tremors, rigidity, and bradykinesia. They can also be used as monotherapy in early stages of Parkinson's disease or as adjunct therapy in combination with levodopa in advanced stages of the disease. Complications. Dopamine agonists can cause several complications, including side effects such as nausea, vomiting, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, hallucinations, and impulse control disorders. Additionally, dopamine agonists can also cause motor fluctuations and dyskinesias similar to levodopa. Typical administration and dosage. Dopamine agonists are typically administered orally as tablets or capsules, although some formulations may be available as transdermal patches or injections. The dosage and dosing schedule may vary depending on the specific dopamine agonist used and the patient's individual needs. The medication may be started at a low dose and gradually increased to achieve optimal symptom control while minimizing side effects. Contraindications and precautions. Dopamine agonists are generally contraindicated in patients with a history of hypersensitivity to dopamine agonists or other ingredients in the medication, severe cardiovascular disease, or a history of psychosis. They should be used in caution in patients with a history of mental health disorders, impulse control disorders, or liver, liver or kidney impairment. Dopamine agonists may also interact with other medications, and caution should be exercised when used in combination with other Parkinson's disease medications to avoid potential drug interactions. Nursing interventions. As a part of nursing management for patients taking dopamine agonists, nursing interventions may include medication administration, ensuring that dopamine agonists are administered as prescribed, following the recommended dosage, timing, and route of administration, monitoring for side effects and complications. Monitor the patient for potential side effects and complications such as nausea, vomiting, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, hallucinations, impulse control issues, and other adverse reactions. Patient education. Provide education to the patient and their caregivers about the purpose, dosage, administration, potential side effects, and precautions of dopamine agonists. Ensure that the patient understands the importance of adhering to the medication schedule and reporting any changes in symptoms or side effects to the healthcare provider. Assessing effectiveness. Evaluate the effectiveness of dopamine agonists in managing the patient's motor symptoms and monitoring for changes in symptoms over time to help guide medication adjustments and optimize therapeutic outcomes. Monoamine oxidase B, MAOB inhibitors. Pharmacological action. MAOB inhibitors work by selectively inhibiting the enzyme monoamine oxidase B. This leads to increased levels of dopamine in the brain because MAOB kind of like chews up the dopamine that's in the brain. This helps to improve motor function and alleviate the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Therapeutic uses. 
MAOB inhibitors are used as adjunct therapy in the management of motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. They are typically used in combination with other medications, such as levodopa, to enhance the effects of dopamine replacement therapy and prolong the duration of symptomatic relief. Complications. MAOB inhibitors are generally well tolerated, but they can cause some complications. Common side effects include gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Other potential complications may include headache, dizziness, insomnia, and hallucinations. Additionally, MAOB inhibitors can interact with other medications and may need to be used with caution in patients with certain medical conditions. Typical administration and dosage. MAOB inhibitors are typically administered orally as tablets or capsules. The dosage and dosing schedule may vary depending on the specific MAOB inhibitor used and the patient's individual needs. They're usually started at a low dose and gradually titrated up to achieve optimal symptom control while minimizing side effects. Contraindications and precautions. MAOB inhibitors are generally contraindicated in patients with a history of hypersensitivity to MAOB inhibitors or other ingredients in the medication, severe liver or kidney impairment, or a history of serotonin syndrome or hypertensive crisis. They should be used with caution in patients with a history of mental health disorders and careful monitoring of blood pressure may be necessary. MAOB inhibitors may also interact with other medications, and caution should be exercised when used in combination with other Parkinson's disease medications to avoid potential drug interactions. MAOB inhibitors should not be used in combination with other MAO inhibitors, certain antidepressants, or other medications that increase serotonin levels, as this can increase the risk of serotonin syndrome. Nursing interventions. As part of nursing management for patients taking MAOB inhibitors, nursing interventions may include medication administration. Ensure that the MAOB inhibitors are administered as prescribed. Follow the recommended dose, timing, and route of administration. Monitor for side effects and complications. Monitor the patient for potential side effects and complications such as GI symptoms, headache, dizziness, insomnia, and hallucinations. Patient education. Provide education to the patient and their caregiver about the purpose, dosage, administration, potential side effects, and precautions of MAOB inhibitors. Ensure that the patient understands the importance of adhering to the medication schedule, reporting any changes in symptoms or side effects to the healthcare provider, and avoiding certain medications that can interact with MAOB inhibitors. Assessing effectiveness. Evaluating the effectiveness of MAOB inhibitors in managing the patient's motor symptoms and monitoring for changes in symptoms over time helps to guide medication adjustments and optimize therapeutic outcomes. Okay, catechol O methyltransferase COMT inhibitors. Pharmacological action. COMT inhibitors work by inhibiting the enzyme COMT, which is responsible for breaking down dopamine in the brain. By inhibiting COMT, these medications increase the levels of dopamine in the brain, which helps to improve motor function and alleviate the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Therapeutic uses. COMT inhibitors are used as adjunct therapy in the management of motor symptoms in Parkinson's. They are typically used in combination with other medications, such as levodopa, to enhance the effects of dopamine replacement therapy and prolong the duration of symptomatic relief. COMT inhibitors can help to reduce the off time, which is the time when Parkinson's symptoms return or worsen between doses of levodopa. Complications. COMT inhibitors are generally well tolerated, but they can cause some complications. Common side effects include gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Other potential complications may include dyskinesias, abnormal involuntary movements, dyspepsia, orthostatic hypotension, and hallucinations. Additionally, COMT inhibitors can interact with other medications and may need to be used with caution in patients with certain medication conditions. Certain medical conditions, sorry guys. Typical administration and dosage. COMT inhibitors are typically administered orally as tablets or capsules. The dosage and dosing schedule may vary depending on the specific COMT inhibitor used and the patient's individual needs. They are usually started at a low dose and gradually titrated up to achieve optimal symptom control while minimizing side effects. Contraindications and precautions. COMT inhibitors are generally contraindicated in patients with a history of hypersensitivity to COMT inhibitors or other ingredients in the medication, severe liver or kidney impairment, a history of certain medical conditions such as narrow angle glaucoma or pheochromocytoma.
they should be used with caution in patients with a history of mental health disorders and careful monitoring of blood pressure may be necessary COMT inhibitors may also interact with other medications and caution should be exercised when used in combination with other Parkinson's disease medications to avoid potential drug interactions. Interactions. COMT inhibitors should not be used in combination with other COMT inhibitors and caution should be exercised when used in combination with other Parkinson's disease medications to avoid potential drug interactions. Nursing interventions. As part of nursing management for patients taking COMT inhibitors, nursing interventions may include medication administration. Ensure that COMT inhibitors are administered as prescribed. Follow the recommended dosage, timing, and route of administration. Monitoring for side effects and complications. Monitor the patient for potential side effects and complications such as GI symptoms, dyskinesias, dyspepsia, orthostatic hypotension, and hallucinations. Patient education. Provide education to the patient and their caregivers about the purpose, dosage, administration, potential side effects, and precautions of COMT inhibitors. Ensure that the patient understands the importance of adhering to the medication schedule, reporting any changes in symptoms or side effects to the healthcare provider, and avoiding certain medications that can interact with COMT inhibitors. Assessing effectiveness. Evaluate the effectiveness of COMT inhibitors so that you can guide any dosages necessary, dosage changes necessary. Anticholinergics. Pharmacological action. Anticholinergics work by blocking the activity of acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptors in the brain. This results in a decrease in the cholinergic activity and an increase in dopaminergic activity, which can help to alleviate the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Therapeutic uses. Anticholinergics are used in the management of motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease, particularly for the control of tremors and rigidity. They are typically used as adjunct therapy in combination with other medications, such as levodopa, dopamine agonists, or COMT inhibitors, to improve motor function and alleviate the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Complications. Anticholinergics can cause a variety of complications. Common side effects include dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, urinary retention, excuse me guys, <laughs> confusion, and memory impairment. They can also cause other side effects such as increased heart rate, dilated pupils, and heat sensitivity. Anticholinergics are generally not recommended for use in elderly patients due to their potential to cause cognitive impairment and increase the risk of falls. Typical administration and dosage. Anticholinergics are typically administered orally as tablets or capsules. Dosage and dosing schedule may vary depending on the specific anticholinergic used and the patient's individual needs. They are usually started at a low dose and gradually titrated up to achieve optimal symptom control while minimizing side effects. Contraindications and precautions. Anticholinergics are generally contraindicated in patients with a history of hypersensitivity to anticholinergics or other ingredients in the medication, urinary retention, narrow angle glaucoma, or gastrointestinal obstruction. They should be used with caution in patients with a history of mental health disorders, cardiovascular disease, or liver or kidney impairment. Anticholinergics may also interact with other medications, and caution should be exercised when used in combination with other medications that have anticholinergic properties. Interactions. Anticholinergics should not be used in combination with other medications that have anticholinergic properties, and caution should be exercised when used in combination with other Parkinson's disease medications to avoid potential drug interactions. Nursing interventions. As part of nursing management for patients taking anticholinergics, Nursing interventions may include medication administration. Ensure that the anticholinergics are administered as prescribed. Follow the recommended dosage, timing, and route of administration. Are you guys getting the point here? Monitor for side effects and complications. Monitor the patient for potential side effects and complications such as dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, urinary retention, confusion, memory impairment, increased heart rate, dilated pupils, and heat sensitivity. 
patient education, providing education to the patient and their caregivers about the purpose, dosage, administration, potential side effects, and precautions of anticholinergics. Ensure that the patient understands the importance of adhering to the medication schedule, reporting any changes in symptoms or side effects to the healthcare provider, and avoid certain medications that can interact with anticholinergics. Assessing effectiveness. Evaluate the effectiveness of anticholinergics in managing the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, particularly tremors. We're going to use that to guide our dosing in the future, okay? Amantadine is a medication that is sometimes used in the management of Parkinson's disease. Pharmacological action. The exact mechanism of action of amantadine in regards to Parkinson's disease is not fully understood. It is believed to work by increasing the release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter in the brain that is responsible for transmitting nerve signals. Amantadine may also block the reuptake of dopamine, which helps to increase the availability of dopamine in the brain and improve motor function. Therapeutic uses. Amantadine is used in the management of motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease, particularly for the control of dyskinesias, which are involuntary movements that can occur as a side effect of long-term levodopa use. Amantadine may also be used as monotherapy in early stages of Parkinson's disease or in combination with other medications such as levodopa or dopamine agonists to improve motor function and alleviate the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Complications. Amantadine can cause a variety of complications. Common side effects include nausea, dizziness, dry mouth, constipation, levato reticularis, that is a mottled discoloration of the skin, and ankle swelling. Less common but more serious side effects may include hallucinations, confusion, agitation, and orthostatic hypotension. Prolonged use of amantadine may result in development of tolerance, so that can reduce its effectiveness over time. Typical administration and dosage. Amantadine is typically administered orally as capsules or tablets. The dosage and dosing schedule may vary depending on the patient's individual needs and the specific formulation of amantadine used. It's usually started at a low dose and gradually titrated up to achieve optimal symptom control while minimizing side effects. Contraindications and precautions. Amantadine is generally contraindicated in patients with a history of hypersensitivity to amantadine or other ingredients in the medication. Seizures glaucoma, or severe liver or kidney impairment. It should be used with caution in elderly patients or those with a history of mental health disorders. Amantadine may also interact with other medications, so caution should be exercised when used in combination with other medications that affect the central nervous system or that have anticholinergic properties. Interactions. Amantadine may interact with medications that affect the central nervous system, such as anticholinergics, antipsychotics, and antidepressants, and caution should be exercised when used in combination with these medications. Nursing interventions. As part of nursing management of patients taking amantadine, nursing interventions may include medication administration. Ensure that the amantadine is administered as prescribed. Follow the recommended dosage, timing, and route of administration. Monitor for side effects and complications. Monitoring the patient for potential side effects and complications such as nausea, dizziness, dry mouth, constipation, levito reticularis, that's that skin condition characterized by a mottled or net-like appearance of the skin and it's typically on the extremities, hallucinations, confusion, agitation, and orthostatic hypotension. Patient education. Provide education to the patient and their caregivers about the purpose, dosage, administration, potential side effects, and precautions of amantadine, and of course, make sure that you are evaluating for effectiveness. Okay, so now we're going to look at some priority problems or nursing diagnoses that might be pertinent for your patient with Parkinson's disease. Remember, we're discussing these as general, so you're going to need to take these and modify them and adapt them for your particular patient. Impaired physical mobility can manifest in various ways in patients with Parkinson's disease. Some common manifestations may include bradykinesia. Parkinson's disease can cause slowness of movement making it difficult for patients to initiate and execute voluntary movements. This can result in decreased ability to perform activities of daily living, such as dressing, bathing, grooming, and feeding. Rigidity. Parkinson's disease can cause muscle stiffness or rigidity, which can limit a patient's range of motion and flexibility, making it challenging to perform tasks that require joint movements, such as reaching, bending, or turning. Postural instability. 
Parkinson's disease can disrupt a patient's balance and coordination, leading to postural instability and an increased risk of falls. This can affect a patient's ability to walk, stand, and perform activities that require good balance. Freezing of gait. Freezing of gait is a common symptom in Parkinson's disease where the patient may suddenly feel stuck or unable to initiate or continue walking. This can severely impact a patient's ability to move safely and independently. Decreased fine motor skills. Parkinson's disease can also affect a patient's fine motor skills, such as buttoning a shirt, tying shoelaces, or writing. This can result in difficulties with tasks that require precise hand movements and coordination. As a nurse, you will play a crucial role in assessing and managing impaired physical mobility in your patients who have Parkinson's disease. Nursing interventions might include assisting with ADLs. You might provide assistance with activities of daily living, such as bathing, dressing, grooming, and feeding, to compensate for the patient's limitations in physical mobility. Promoting safety. You should implement fall prevention strategies, such as ensuring a safe environment, assisting with transfers and ambulation, and providing education to patients and caregivers on fall prevention techniques. Collaborating with the interdisciplinary team, you really need to work closely with the interdisciplinary team, including physical and occupational therapists, to develop and implement a customized mobility and exercise program for this patient to improve their physical function and maintain independence. Provide assistive devices. You're going to assess the need for assistive devices such as canes, walkers, or other mobility aids and provide education on their proper use to optimize physical mobility. And we're going to encourage regular physical activity because regular physical activity such as walking, stretching, and strengthening exercises can help improve physical mobility in our patients with Parkinson's. We can provide education and support to patients and caregivers on the importance of regular physical activity and assist them to develop an appropriate exercise plan. There are several factors related to Parkinson's disease that may contribute to an increased risk of falls, and these include postural instability. Parkinson's disease can disrupt a patient's balance and coordination, making it challenging to maintain an upright posture and increasing the risk of falls, especially during activities such as standing, walking, or transferring. Freezing of gait. Remember, freezing of gait is a common symptom in Parkinson's, and the patient may suddenly feel stuck or unable to initiate or continue walking. This often happens when going through a narrow area or walking through a doorway. This can result in sudden and unexpected falls. Bradykinesia. Parkinson's disease can cause slowness of movement, making it difficult for patients to react quickly or appropriately to prevent a fall in situations where a quick response is required, such as tripping or stumbling. Does your patient have a little dog that likes to run around his feet or even a cat? Do they have kids in the home? This could be a problem. Rigidity. Parkinson's disease can cause muscle stiffness or rigidity, which can affect a patient's ability to adjust their body position or break a fall. Medication side effects. Some medications that are used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease may have side effects such as dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, or sedation, and this is all going to increase the risk of falls. So as a nurse, again, you play a crucial role in assessing and managing the risk of falls in your patients with Parkinson's. So nursing interventions might include a fall risk assessment. Make sure you're using a validated tool and consider factors such as history of falls, gait and balance impairments, medication use, and environmental hazards. Fall prevention strategies. Again, we're going to implement our fall prevention strategies such as ensuring a safe environment, removing tripping hazards, improving lighting, providing education to patients and caregivers on fall prevention techniques. Mobility and exercise programs. Once again, we're going to collaborate with that PT or that OT, and we're going to develop and implement a customized mobility and exercise program for the patient to improve their balance, their strength, their coordination. Medication management. We're going to collaborate with the healthcare team, like the pharmacist and the physician. We're going to manage medication side effects, such as adjusting dosages or timing of medications to minimize the risk of falls and education and counseling. We're gonna provide education and counseling to patients and caregivers on strategies to prevent falls, such as the proper use of assistive devices, safe ambulation techniques, and strategies to manage freezing of gait episodes. And assistive devices. We're going to assess their need for assistive devices, such as canes, walkers, or other mobility aids, and provide education on their proper use to optimize safety and prevent falls.
Okay, so a self-care deficit may manifest in various areas of self-care. It could be personal hygiene, dressing, grooming, feeding, toileting, mobility, or other ADLs. Impaired physical mobility and motor coordination, along with cognitive and mood changes, can hinder a patient's ability to perform these tasks independently, and this results in the self-care deficit. So once again, you guys, you play a crucial role in assessing and managing this self-care deficit for your patients. So nursing interventions may include assessment of self-care abilities. You need to get in there and assess your patient's ability to perform ADLs independently. Consider factors such as their motor symptoms, their cognitive changes, their mood disturbances, and their overall functional status. Care planning. Come on, you're going to collaborate with the interdisciplinary team. Make sure you're talking to that OT, that PT. Develop a care plan to address the patient's specific self-care deficits and establish appropriate goals and interventions. Patient and caregiver education. You're going to provide education to your patient and their caregivers on strategies to promote self-care, such as energy conservation techniques. I know we've talked about that a lot. Adaptive strategies and use of assistive devices or modifications in the environment to facilitate independence in ADLs. Adaptive strategies. You're going to teach your patients and their caregivers adaptive strategies and techniques to compensate for motor or cognitive deficits, such as simplified grooming routines, modified utensils for feeding, or techniques to manage freezing of gait during mobility. And if you guys are hearing a whole lot of squeaking, I apologize. My poodle just had eight puppies. So yeah, puppies. Anyway. So environmental modifications. You're going to assess and make recommendations for environmental modifications to optimize safety and independence and self-care. So we might need to install grab bars. We might need non-slip mats. We're definitely going to need proper lighting in the home. Medication management. You need to work with the physician and the pharmacist to manage medications that impact self-care abilities, such as adjusting dosages or timing of medications to minimize side effects or optimize motor function. And monitoring and support. You're going to monitor the patient's self-care abilities over time. You're going to watch to see how it fluctuates or changes. Provide ongoing support and counseling to both the patient and the caregiver. We want to promote self-care independence. We want to address any challenges as they come up, and so you have to have open communication. We're going to provide a lot of emotional support. You're there for your patients. They need you. Okay, now we're on to impaired communication. This can manifest in various ways. It might be slurred speech, soft or monotone voice, difficulty finding the right words, impaired articulation, reduced facial expression, impaired hearing or auditory processing, or challenges in understanding others or following conversations. Nursing interventions may include assessment of communication abilities, you're going to assess your patient's ability to communicate effectively. We're going to look at their motor symptoms, their cognitive changes, their voice quality, their overall functional status. Um, there's assessment tools out there you can look up, like the Parkinson Voice Scale, the Unified Parkinson Disease Rating Scale, and speech and swallowing evalu evaluations might be used. Care planning. Okay, again, you're going to collaborate with the interdisciplinary team. Or make sure you're talking to the speech language pathologists. Develop a care plan that addresses the patient's specific communication deficits and establishes appropriate goals and interventions. You spend more time with the patient than the speech language pathologist does. So make sure you're informing the speech and language pathologist of things that the patient tells you that are very relevant to their evaluation. Okay. Communication strategies. You're going to teach patients and caregivers communication strategies to improve speech and voice quality, such as slowing down speech, using amplification devices, practicing vocal exercises, and using nonverbal communication techniques. Environmental modifications. We're going to assess and make recommendations for the environmental modifications that optimize communication now. So we're going to look at reducing background noise, using visual aids, positioning the patient for optimal hearing and visual access during conversations. Medication management. Again, we're going to collaborate with the pharmacist and the physician to manage medications that may impact speech and communication abilities, such as adjusting dosages or timing of medications to minimize side effects or optimize vocal function. Remember, you spend more time with the patient than the physician or the pharmacist does. Monitoring and support. You're going to monitor your patient's communication abilities over time. They're going to change, okay? We're going to provide ongoing support and counseling to the patient and the caregiver to address challenges as they come up. We're going to provide emotional support and facilitate effective communication.
Impaired swallowing, okay. This is also going to manifest in various ways. They could have difficulty initiating swallowing. They might cough or choke during or after eating or drinking. They might have regurgitation. Oh, that sounds lovely, doesn't it? They might have a feeling of food getting stuck in their throat. They might have a weak or gurgled voice after swallowing. They could have prolonged meal times. It takes them forever. Or they might avoid eating altogether or drinking because they're afraid of choking or having pain or discomfort. So your nursing interventions, you're going to assess their swallowing function, assess how they swallow, observe them during meals, conduct a formal swallow evaluation. Um, you might have the speech language pathologist come in to do a bedside swallow evaluation. They might need a video fluoroscopic swallow study, VFSS, or a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, F-E-E-S, okay? Care planning, once again, you're collaborating with that interdisciplinary team. The important person here is that speech language pathologist, but also the dietitian. We're gonna develop a care plan that addresses the patient's specific swallowing de deficits and establishes appropriate goals and interventions. Swallowing strategies. You're going to teach your patients and their caregivers specific swallowing strategies to improve safety and efficiency during meals, such as sitting upright, taking smaller bites or sits, alternating food and fluid intake, and avoiding distractions during meals. Okay, modified food and fluid consistency. Okay, we're going to work with the dietitian and the speech language pathologist to determine do they need a different consistency of their food or fluid? Do they need thickened liquids, soft or pureed foods? Do they need a mechanically altered diet? And this is all going to be based on the patient's swallowing abilities and recommendations from the speech language pathologist and the dietitian. Environmental modifications. You're going to assess and make recommendations for environmental modifications to optimize swallowing, such as reducing distractions during meals, providing appropriate seating and positioning, and maybe even using assistive devices or utensils to aid. Medication management. You're going to collaborate with the physician and the pharmacist to manage medications that can impact swallowing function. We might have to adjust dosages or timing of medications to minimize side effects or optimize swallowing. Monitoring and support. Again, you're going to monitor how your patient's swallowing function changes over time because it will. We're going to provide ongoing support and counseling to the patient and the caregiver. We're going to collaborate with the interdisciplinary team to address challenges as they come up. We're going to provide emotional support and facilitate safe swallowing. Risk factors for impaired nutrition can include difficulties with feeding, chewing, and swallowing due to motor symptoms, decreased appetite, or changes in taste perception. It can be a medication side effect. They might have gastrointestinal issues such as constipation or gastroparesis, and factors related to aging, comorbidities, or other individual patient characteristics. Nursing interventions for risk for impaired nutrition in Parkinson's disease might include Oh, I don't know, maybe assess the nutritional status. Assess your patient. Look at their weight, their body mass index, their dietary intake, their appetite, their hydration status, and any signs of malnutrition or dehydration. Monitor their swallowing function. You may need to assess the patient's swallowing function in between the formal studies. We're going to observe them during meals or con Conduct a formal swallowing evaluation. We may have the speech language pathologist come in to do the bedside swallow eval, the video fluoroscopic swallow study, or that fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. We're going to collaborate with the interdisciplinary team. Come on, that's what we do, right? We're going to talk to the dietitian, the speech language pathologist, and the physicians. We're going to develop and implement an appropriate nutrition plan based on this patient's specific needs, preferences, and recommendations. Education and counseling. We do a lot of that, guys. It's one of our primary roles. So we're going to provide education and counseling to the patient and the caregiver about the importance of maintaining adequate nutrition, strategies they can use to improve nutritional intake, and managing potential feeding difficulties, including medication management, dietary modifications, and lifestyle changes. Assistance with feeding. We very well may need to provide assistance with feeding, including meal planning, meal preparation, supervision during meals. We might need to assist with positioning, help them with utensil use, or other adaptive strategies to facilitate safe and efficient eating. 
Medication management. Again, we're going to work with the physician and the pharmacist. We're going to manage medications that impact their nutrition, such as adjusting dosages or timing of medications to minimize their side effects or to optimize their nutritional intake. Monitoring and follow-up. Again, we're going to monitor the patient's nutrition status over time. We'll provide ongoing support and facilitate regular follow-up so that we can assess and manage any changes in the patient's nutritional status and make any intervention changes as needed. And finally, anxiety and depression in Parkinson's disease can arise from a variety of factors. This includes the impact of motor symptoms on daily functioning, changes in the patient's lifestyle and roles, psychological distress related to the diagnosis and the prognosis of a chronic illness, and even neurochemical changes in the brain due to the underlying neurodegenerative process. These psychological symptoms can contribute to increased stress, decreased quality of life, and impaired overall well-being for our patients with Parkinson's. So nursing interventions for anxiety or depression that we're going to follow include assessment. We want to assess their anxiety or depression symptoms. Use standardized assessment tools. Use patient interviews. Use observation of behavioral and emotional changes. Talk to their caregivers. This may include evaluating their mood, affect, sleep patterns, appetite, energy level, concentration, and overall psychological well-being. All of those can be impacted by anxiety or depression. Education and counseling. We're going to provide education and counseling to our patient and to their caregivers about the fact that it's common to have anxiety and depression in Parkinson's. We want to talk to them about the impact these symptoms can have on overall health and well-being. We want them to be aware that it's not unusual and they're not alone. We want to include strategies to help them manage and cope with these symptoms. And this may include discussing coping mechanisms, relaxation techniques, stress management strategies, support groups, okay? Medication management. We're going to collaborate again with the pharmacist and the physician to manage medications for anxiety or depression. That could be antidepressants, anxiolytic medications. And now we're going to have to monitor for the effectiveness of those medications, side effects, and any potential drug interactions with the medications we're already giving them. We may need to provide a referral for psychological or psychiatric support because, come on, there is only so much we can do at the bedside. We have our limitations. We are not psychiatrists. We are not counselors. We need to collaborate with mental health professionals, such as psychologists or psychiatrists, to provide specialized assessment and treatment when we see anxiety or depression in our Parkinson's patient. Okay? This may include cognitive behavioral therapy, supportive counseling, or other evidence-based interventions. Supportive care. We provide supportive care to address the emotional and psychological needs of our patient with Parkinson's disease. Yes, we're going to provide those referrals, but the fact is our patient knows us, they trust us, they confide in us. So we need to use active listening, empathy, validate their emotions, provide a safe and completely non-judgmental space for the patient to express their feelings and concerns. Remember what I always tell you. You have to know what your own ish is and you have to leave your ish at the door because when you're in that patient room, you are there for the patient. We need to collaborate, okay? We're going to collaborate with physicians, social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, other healthcare providers to develop and implement a comprehensive care plan that addresses the patient's physical, emotional, and psychological needs in relation to their anxiety and depression. Monitor and follow up. Again, we're going to monitor their anxiety or their depression symptoms over time. We want to watch for any changes. We want to intervene quickly so that we can prevent them from having a bad outcome. We want to provide ongoing support and facilitate regular follow up with not just us, but the whole interdisciplinary team so that we can assess and manage changes in their mental health status and adjust interventions as needed. Okay, guys. I know this was a lot of information. I really hope you were using your active learning templates in order to fill this out as we went through. I'm gonna put in as many bookmarks as I can to kind of help you go back to sections that you feel like you need to review.